Hey, thanks again for clicking on the message. I'm Chris Calloway. Everybody just calls me coach because I've coached football for over 27 years and I've coached life for over 14 years in ministry. Today, we're going to be talking about part three or week three of a series we've called Divine Direction. And we're going to be discussing a topic that I call Trust the Process. Trust the process of making good decisions. We're going to dig into that, what that process is. And our decisions that we make are very important in our life. We are where we are in life today because of our past decisions that we've made. And our future will be determined by the decisions we make today and moving forward. So the stories we'll be telling tomorrow will be based on the decisions that we're making in life today. In week one of the message, if you haven't seen week one and week two, I encourage you to go out to the website, therockwm.com, and, and check it out. But in week one, we talked about how not many people are great decision makers all the time. I know I've certainly not. I haven't made the best decisions in my entire life. I've made great decisions, I've made some good decisions, and I've made some really bad decisions in life, and I'm sure you have too. And we talked about there's an indecisiveness in today's world because of all the choices that we have. We just have more choices today to consider in making decisions. So sometimes that creates a, uh, kind of paralyzes us. It's like, wow, I've got so many choices before me and it hinders our ability to make the choice or make the right choice. We talked about that in week one. In week two, last week, we talked about the illusion of perfection. And we kind of went through how in today's world, we've, uh, everybody uses social media. And in social media, we kind of see everybody else's highlight reel. And it's really an illusion of perfection. And we kind of compare ourselves to everybody else. And that hinders us sometimes from making a decision because we feel like, man, we've got to make a perfect decision every time. And sometimes in life, that's not, uh, we're not, it's not available to us. Sometimes we don't make the perfect decision. But because of the things that we have in our life today, we have an illusion of perfection in other people's lives and we compare ourselves to that. And it really sometimes can hinder us from making our own decision because we don't want to make an imperfect decision. This week, I want to talk about what I want to call over-programming our kids. And I found some research and it really was fascinating to me when I read this research. So here's what researchers said. They said, kids today are in so many planned activities where everything's already decided for them that they haven't been able to develop the decision-making muscle. So I want you to think about that. It's really powerful what these researchers said, that everything is kind of decided and planned for kids today, that they haven't developed that decision-making muscle. Now, we have a lot of people that really battle with indecisiveness because of that. They've battled with uh, trying to make decisions and they just kind of get frozen and paralyzed because of the things we've talked about. Another example is when I was young, uh, you know, I wanted to get a job as a teenager, right? So I was willing to take whatever job I could get. Whoever would offer me the job, I was willing to take it because I wanted to work. I wanted to make a little bit of money. And uh, whatever job was offered and paid, that's what I would take. I wasn't that picky. And it, recently I had a uh, talk with my oldest son, and we spent about, he spent about 30 minutes telling me the type of job that he didn't want to go get. And I think you can kind of relate to that. And, you know, my comeback or my line to him was, you know, maybe you should just apply to everywhere and take a job when it's offered to you if they're giving you pay, right? But he was like, well, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that because of these reasons and those reasons. And I think that what these researchers are saying is exactly true. You know, we have all of these things the way they were raised, where everything was decided for them and all their activities were planned out. They didn't have to really make decisions. They were told what to do and where to do it and how to do it. Uh, they've got an illusion of perfection through social media and there's just so many options and choices and they just don't execute a decision process very effectively. So how do we become more decisive? How do we use wisdom to make the right decision and how do we seek divine direction to get God's guidance in our decision-making process? I want to go to Acts chapter 20 and kind of dig in there and use that text today as our foundational text to give us some wisdom on how to make good decisions. So a little context before I read the scripture. In Acts chapter 20, Paul's talking about uh, making a very emotional decision for him. He was uh, in Ephesus and he loved it there. He didn't want to leave it. He loved the people. It was his people. It was his type of his type of town. He was very comfortable there, very happy there, and he felt at home there, and he didn't want to leave. But then God prompted him. So I want to read Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24 for you. 
Now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So I want to dig into this scripture and unpack it and use it as our guide today to talk about how we're going to trust the process. And I'm going to outline four steps for you in God's process that will allow you to make better decisions in your life. So if you're taking notes, get ready to write these four steps down. And by the way, you can go out to the website, therockwm.com, and print out my notes. We've got today's message outline and, and the notes in there. You can just go up in the main message library, find uh, the, the message, print the notes out, and there's some extra space on there for you to jot down notes as well. But the first step is this. Step one is the Spirit is prompting. Here, Paul, we see being prompted by the Spirit. It's Acts 20, 22. And now compelled by the Spirit, Paul says. So he was compelled by the Spirit. So the Spirit's prompting is the first step in seeking God's wisdom and divine direction in our decision-making process. Prompting. Here's what I can assure you. When the Spirit is prompting you, when God is prompting you through the Holy Spirit that's in you and compelling you to do something, I can promise you it's very, very important. And we need to make sure that we're paying attention to it. I want to give you two examples in my life. I could give you many, many examples, but I'll give you two examples. One that seemed to be insignificant and one that turned out to be a major, major decision in my life. The first example is uh, recently I felt like I needed to tell something to a friend of mine and I was going to just shoot him a quick text, text what I needed to say and just hit send and text him a message. But as I was typing the text, I just felt prompted and kind of compelled by the spirit. Hey, don't text him. Actually pick up the phone and call. So I picked up the phone and just gave him a call to tell him what I needed to tell him. And when, I, when he answered the phone, we ended up talking for over an hour because he really was dealing with something and he needed someone to share it with and someone to talk to. And my phone call was perfect timing. And I didn't know that at first. I just had to tell him something that was relatively insignificant and I was just going to shoot the text. But the Spirit prompted me, said, don't text him today. Pick up the phone and call. And he needed that phone conversation. So that was significant that the Spirit of God prompted me to do that and be a friend to him via that phone call. Another example, which is a big time example and a major significant decision in my life that I, where I was compelled is I had been hired by a company and I was in a two week training class out of state <coughs> with a bunch of people. And uh, throughout that first week of uh, class, all the people that were going to this class and going through this training, we would go out and have dinner afterwards and sometimes go uh, out after dinner and have a little fun. And uh, we were sharing cars because not everybody, we kind of carpooled down. Uh, I was from Georgia and this training was in Alabama and Birmingham area. And we went and we were, so every, every night we'd go out to eat after class and sometimes we'd go downtown Birmingham and have, have some fun. And then I would ride back with the person that had traveled with me and I was in his car, actually, I didn't have a car. One night, I think it was uh, Friday or Saturday night, we were going, getting ready to go out. So everybody was talking about, man, we, we're gonna go out and we're gonna go to this place and this place and everybody was looking forward to it. And we was taking a shower to get ready and everybody was kind of getting ready and we we're probably 10 or 15 minutes from leaving. I was out of the shower, getting dressed, doing my hair, all excited about going out on the town with all my, my friends that I'd met at this class. And man, the Spirit of God just started speaking to me and just something inside me, something internal said, man, don't go tonight. And so I was like, you know, kind of trying to ignore that because all the peer pressure and all my friends were like, come on, let's go, hurry up, we're waiting on you, Chris. We're ready to hit the road. And man, as I was finally got ready and got dressed and went downstairs in a little town home that we had rented, man, it was just real heavy on me. Don't go tonight. And it was so strong that I turned down all the peer pressure because when I said, you know, I think I'm going to let you guys go tonight. I'm not going to go. Uh, and then everybody's like, come on, man, what are you talking about? And I just, I paid attention to that prompting. The Spirit of God was compelling me not to go, and I didn't go. Well, I was awakened at about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning. I had fallen asleep. Everybody was gone. I was the only one that stayed back, and I was awoken by some of the other guys that were in that class. And the guy that I would have been driving with, that I'd been riding with all week, that went down to the training with me, his name was Chuck. And they said, Chuck has been in a car accident. And they woke me up, 
and we went to this, this site, and the cops were all there. The car had flipped over like 10 times. He was going really fast. He was speeding. I think they said he was going in excess of 100 miles an hour when he wrecked and started flipping. He got thrown out of the car. They found him like 150 yards from the car. He got ejected out of the sunroof, and uh, they had already taken him to the emergency room. Time we got down to the emergency room, I was his only connection at this uh, training we were at, and they said he's not going to make it. And he lived about, uh, I want to say about six or seven hours, uh, but uh, he passed away. And I would have been in that car. I, would have, I was in that car every night up until that night, but God compelled me not to go. So that was a significant, significant decision in my life that I paid attention and I was aware of the Spirit's prompting and I decided not to go or I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. All right, step two, if you're taking notes, is what I call certain uncertainty. So the first step in God's process is Spirit's prompting. Pay attention to God's Spirit prompting you. And step two is certain uncertainty. Back to Paul's example in Acts 20, verse 22. It says, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. And then he says, not knowing what will happen to me there, I know I am called to go. Not knowing what will happen to me there, but I know I'm called to go. You know, God doesn't always give us the details. God doesn't always give us everything that we're going to encounter in the future. But he does prompt us and say, you need to go or you need to do this. But we not, may not know why he's prompting us. Just what Paul said there. You know, he says, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to me there, but I know that I'm called to go. And you may say, well, Chris, I want the details. I want to know. I want all the details. Well, you're not always going to get all the details. Remember that scene in A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholson was on the stand and he talked about, he said, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. Well, God, God is saying, you want all the details? And we say, yeah, we want all the details. And God's saying, you can't handle all the details, my child. So we're not always going to get all the details because we can't handle them. And I, in reality, I think that if we had all the details, we might not be obedient to what God is telling us to do. We might not say yes if we knew all the details. But even without all the details, God will lead us step by step if we'll just pay attention and put one foot in front of the other. In fact, I love what it says in Psalms. In Psalms chapter 119, verse 105, it says this, The word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. So in God's word, he's saying, hey, it, the word of God is a light to my feet, and it will light my path, and it will show me what step, the next step. Take that step. So we know, you know, we're not always going to know what steps six, seven, and eight is. We've got to do steps one, two, and three first. Amen? So listen, if you're um, not living with a little uncertainty, then you can't live with faith. And we know if we're not living in faith that we can't be pleasing to God. That's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So God is not going to give us all the details. He's going to give us a little bit of direction, and we've got to have the faith to step one step at a time and make the decision today to serve and be obedient to him. <clears throat> Up in verse 1 in Hebrews 11, it tells us, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. So we know we, sometimes we're not going to see everything, but God wants us to live by faith because without faith it is impossible to please him. So uh, we're always going to have some uncertainty. So God's process, step one, is the Spirit is prompting. Pay attention to that. Step two, understand you're going to have, certainly going to have some uncertainty, uh, and that's okay. And step three is predictable resistance. So write that down. Step three, predictable resistance. And you can mark it on your calendar that the enemy is going to resist you, if you are doing God's will. Guaranteed it's going to happen. Back here in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, back to Paul's example, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Man, that's no fun to read, right? I mean, he's saying, you know, I don't know exactly what God has in store for me, but I know I'm called to go. And then he goes on and says, hey, the Holy Spirit's warned me that prison and hardships are facing me. But there's always going to be challenges, obstacles, and resistance to living a life of faith and living a life in God's will. You can mark it down. The enemy is always going to put obstacles and challenges up in front of you. And see, a lot of people will say, you know, it's not, it's not going smoothly. Maybe I made the wrong decision because this isn't working out the way I thought it would work out. And there's a ton of challenge in this thing. Maybe I didn't make the right decision. But, or maybe you did. Maybe you made the perfect decision, 
and the enemy's just giving you those obstacles and those challenges and is resisting you because you're in God's will. But sometimes the religious people will flip that around and use it in the negative. Maybe I made the wrong decision. Maybe I wasn't supposed to do this because of all the challenge and obstacles and resistance that I'm experiencing. But maybe that's exactly a sign that you're doing God's will. We will face opposition in trying to stop us from carrying out and making progress in God's will. Amen. So. So maybe the struggle you're having today is going to backfire on the enemy. He meant it for your harm and for your stress and worry, but you're going to be able to use it and flip it right back around and throw it right back at him and develop spiritual strength and go on to bigger and greater and better things because of it. So don't get stressed out and worried when you have resistance because step one in the process is spiritual prompting. Step two is certain uncertainty. Step three is predictable resistance. And here's step four. So write this down again if you're taking notes. Step four is uncommon confidence. You know, in Acts 20, 24, let me summarize what we've talked about so far. You know, he said, I've been prompted by the Spirit. Spiritual prompting, so important. Then he went on and Paul said, I know that I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem, but I don't know what's going to happen to me there. Certain uncertainty. That's part of the process. Number three, he said, I do not, I do know that it's going to be difficult when I get there. Predictable resistance. And then in Acts 20, 24, he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task to testifying the good news of God's grace. Uncommon confidence. I mean, he knew uh, that he was leaving a place that he loved and that he was going to go through all these things. He was prompted. There was going to be uncertainty. There was going to be resistance. In his case, he talked about hardships and even prison. But he had the confidence to go ahead and be faithful to what God had asked him to do. So uncommon confidence in making the decisions that you know God is leading you to make. The biggest question is, how does all this apply to you and apply to your life? Where are you in life? And what are you currently doing? And what decisions are coming up in your life? And where are you going to have to sit still, listen for that prompting, know there's going to be some uncertainty, know there's probably going to be some resistance, but have some uncommon confidence and go ahead and make a decision based on the wisdom that God has provided you. All right, so I've got a prayer for you, and I think it's going to be a prayer you're going to want to be a part of. So I want to pray over your life and encourage you through prayer. So I want you to hang on for just a couple more minutes, and we'll get to that in just a second. But a couple quick announcements and a couple reminders for you before we get to the prayer. If you have any questions, go out to our website, info at therockwm.com. That's our email address, info at therockwm.com. And you can email us, or you can just go out to the website, therockwm.com, and fill out a contact form there as well. And Click into those uh, teen messages and those youth messages. We have three different libraries for youth. We have a teen library called our Switch Library. That's ages 13 to 18 messages and lessons specifically targeted to teenagers. We also have preteens from 10 to age 12, the middle school age group, and we have youth messages as well for children under the age of 10. So get your kids involved in those lessons. I believe they'll be a blessing to them as well. Now, real important. Watch, share, and give. You've watched the message, and we're so thankful that you did. But not only leave a comment and hit that like button for us, but share these messages. Share them on your social media platforms. It may be a message that someone really needs to hear that you're friends with, and the only way that we hear it is if you share it. So go ahead and hit share and say, hey, I wanted to share this message with you about divine direction. Trust the process. I think it'll be a blessing to someone if you'll just share the message and pray about giving. If you'd like to pray about giving, we encourage you to do that. You can text the word GIVE to 678-771-6777 if you feel led to do that. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the message today. I believe today's message will be anointed, that you will anoint the words that you had me speak today to impact the lives of those that are listening, Lord. Lord, we ask you to help us make better decisions and make right decisions in our life. And we know that, Lord, that you will prompt us. So we seek and ask for your prompting. And Lord, when there's uncertainty, don't let us scare us off or don't let it paralyze us. And when there's resistance, Lord, allow us to stand in faith and stand strong in your word, knowing that you have led us to the place that we're at. And we're going to use that resistance against the enemy to only be better and stronger in our life. And Lord, give us that uncommon confidence. So everyone that's watched this message today, I pray a special blessing over their life, ask you to reach down and touch them. 
love them, forgive them for their sins as you forgive me for mine, and just bless them, Lord, and give them divine direction and wisdom and understanding to make quality and better and right decisions in their life. And we thank you for that, Lord. We give you a right to move in, lead us and guide us in all that we do. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, next week is Easter, so we've got a special Easter message for you next week. And then after Easter, we'll pick back up in the second week of April with the fourth message of this series, The Divine Direction, Start with Faith. Amen. Look forward to seeing you next week on Easter Sunday. God bless. How do I know Jesus really rose from the dead? Why is Christianity different than the rest of religion? How do you know there is a why God? Why do horrible things If I've been following Jesus for people. so long, why how am I still so I believe broken? In if I'm a good enough see. person, how do I know the isn't that Why would a God that created the heavens and the universe? How do you know the universe? Why do so many terrible things? Other people are but I don't really